Well, we're going to take a look at the instructional design. Uh, uh, many of you know uh, it's one of my deepest loves professionally, um, uh, something that I've practiced and been involved in and thinking about and been a scholar in for a long time. And, and I, uh, uh, I think it's an incredibly important area. And it's, it's so important that it's even embedded in a way in uh, the title of our program, isn't it, for Educational Technology and Design. Um, now, instructional design is one of those things that uh, involves the scientific parts of who we are, uh, all those things that we know about, how people learn, how you sequence instruction, if you want to do certain kind, accomplish certain kinds of things, and 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 how you shape content and how you approach people. There, there's a lot of of good, solid research uh, that and and a scientific side to what we do um, that's quite important in forms who we are. But there's also the creative side and um, um, that, that side that's expansive, the side that is less well-defined, that's part of the craft of who we are as designers. And, and instructional design brings those together, brings both of those elements together. And I think it's one of the things that I've always just so deeply loved about the area is that it allows me to, to apply what I know and, and with some confidence but also to explore creatively and and to develop uh, instruction as as a craft and uh, and and do things and find the unexpected and uh, the serendipity of what we do and all of that all that plays into it and in instructional design uh, I think we celebrate all of those things and it's a field that's evolved it's grown, it's, uh, it's moved quite a bit from its beginnings, and you'll do some readings around that. But um, the thing is, is that, that a lot of people don't even know what instructional design is, and I think it's because of a confusion of language we have in our field. Um, I think sometimes we, we confuse it with things like instructional systems design. It's, it's called that sometimes. Sometimes people will refer to instructional systems technology. I graduated from a program called instructional systems technology at uh, Indiana University. Um, it's also called instructional development by some people. Performance technology gets involved in, in some, of the, some of the conversations. We have instructional technology and educational technology. All of those kinds of... Uh, uh, all, all of those labels are bouncing around in our field. So I thought I'd take uh, just a stab at defining what instructional design is and then situating it in the field very loosely. I realize that there could be some controversy even around it, but not a lot. Um, what is instructional design? Well, it's been defined by various people over the years. And uh, Gordon Rowland, who is, is at Eth Ithaca College in New York, is really a great scholar in this area, has been for a long time. And very early on, he came up with a definition that I quite liked. He said, it's an iterative process that identifies and interprets learning needs within the context of, the sp of a specific instructional situation. Now, what I like about that is iter iterative, you know, we go at stuff, and I'll be, I'll be using that word, and perhaps even pronouncing it better several times here. Um, uh, but it's something that we do over, we pick at things over and over and over again until we get them right. We craft things and uh, uh, that focus on learning needs. We don't, uh, we don't just do things for the fun of it. We do it because we think there's an identify, we, a need we can identify and that we do try to address. And uh, there's also, and his, his important notion of the context of the specific instructional situation, that there's a larger, there, there are these forces at work, and they are always at work whenever you're designing. You don't design in isolation. And I really like his, uh, his, his definition as a result. Um, uh, Smaldino and Magliero came along a little bit later and said that uh, it's an intellectual process which systematically analyzes the needs of learners and provides features uh, to assist designers to construct uh, possibilities to responsibly address those needs. Now, what I like is the notion of possibilities here, and I really um, like the notion of, uh, of providing for needs again and, um, and 
providing features to assist designers. I'm not so shot with the notion of systematically analyzing all the time or the structure of those possibilities. Um, uh, I think we've grown beyond that. I think that those are important things to do sometimes. Sometimes we can be systematic about what we do and it pays off. Sometimes we can be highly structured in what we do and it pays off and it's appropriate for a context we're in. But I think all of these things are so context dependent that uh, uh, we need to keep the fluid nature of instructional design uh, in mind at all times. I, I really think we do. Um, so where does it fit in the field? Well, let's take the big field of educational technology. If you take that, and we're all educational technologists, but it includes all kinds of things, doesn't it? I mean, everything from, from social media and digital citizenship and media literacy and, and things like that, all the way through to instructional design and some of the things we're talking about here. So inside educational technology, I think there are those instructional technologies, those things that we use to teach people stuff, okay? Uh, those, those things that are used by people so they can learn um, and, and relatively formal as compared to the informal ways that we, we learn all over the place. Well, within that, then there's instructional development. We, we might be uh, developing video or uh, online experiences for people um, uh, to achieve some of the things that we're trying to accomplish through instructional technology within the field of educational technology. Well, in order to accomplish decent development work, we need to be able to design stuff. We need to design it well. We need to design it in a way that makes sense. And that sense-making and <clears throat> that... Um, that ability to do things well is just fundamental to who we are as instructional designers. As we combine both the scientific and the, and the creative or craft side of what we do. Well, along comes good old Addie, right? Uh, now, Addie is that traditional model of instructional design. Okay? Uh, it deals with systematically approaching a problem and analyzing it, designing for it, developing the stuff, implementing the stuff, and then evaluating its, its effectiveness, and then pushing back through the system and reanalyzing, designing, developing. Hey, it's iterative because you might, and, it, and even with Addy, people never have suggested that you start at the beginning and finish at the end. You might come to an Addy <clears throat> defined instructional design problem already with a, a, a development avenue um, a selected. You might know you're going to do a website. You might know that you're going to do a video uh, going in. That might be one of, the, uh, one of the conditions under which you're working right from the start. So it, things don't necessarily happen in this order, but Addy does suggest an order. It is suggested, and um, uh, when you get down to then using something like Addy to then start to design stuff, it starts to look something like this. Um, uh, you, uh, you identify some instructional goals, let's say. Uh, then you conduct learner analyses and instructional analyses. You might do a needs assessment. You might do a context analysis, all those kinds of things. You then might design and develop performance objectives, and then you might design and develop evaluation instruments, then design uh, instructional strategies to meet those, select media that are appropriate for that, and then develop materials and implement them, and then conduct formative evaluation and ultimately um, uh, uh, summative evaluations. So in a traditional model of instructional design, you have, um, you have a system, you have an approach, you have a procedure that um, effectively you think about problems in that way. And then in some cases, it's even been suggested by a lot of people that you actually go about the process of designing, implementing, and evaluating the instruction in that order. Um, another way to look at this then is through the Addy stages, is that you first analyze needs 
and learners and instruction and context. Kind of assumes that you've got an instructional problem brought to you in the first place. And you're trying to answer questions of, of why are we doing this? Uh, who are we doing it with and for? Um, uh, what exactly is it we're doing and, and where is it going to happen? Where's that context? So we're trying to answer questions like that in, in the analysis stage so that we get a good sense of what we're doing before we go about the expensive and, and work-intensive processes of designing and developing stuff. Okay, the next thing we do is burst into design. So we design instructional strategies. How are we going to approach this? What are we going to do first, second, third, and fourth? We then start de designing the materials and the activities and the exercises that will, uh, will accomplish those things. And then, of course, um, uh, we need to design assessments. So you design your assessments, build them right in early on in the process so that they don't get divorced from the activities and the, uh, and, and the objectives you're after. Then you develop the stuff, you know, instructional strategies, how are you going to do things, uh, materials, activities, and exercises, which things will you ultimately do, which will you develop, and then assessments to, uh, to determine how well uh, things have been done. You implement those things, you implement them with, usually, you know, you'll try a few things out with individuals, uh, you'll then try them out in field tests, and then you'll move to full implementation, just depending on how much, how much time, what your resources are, what the pressures are that are on you as an instructional designer. Very practical things get involved in some of these decisions. And so at the implement, implementation stage, you're, uh, you're hoping that you can iteratively move. Because after each one of those tryouts of materials of implementation, you would probably be going back to the, the idea is you go back to the, to the uh, drawing board on stuff and you make corrections, edits, uh, big changes, whatever has to be done in order to make it as, as good a product as it can possibly be. And then, of course, in evaluation, we... Uh, we deal with, with formative evaluation and summative evaluation, answering uh, how could we do this better uh, or how wonderful is this. Summative evaluation really being a confirmation evaluation where you, you go in to demonstrate that you've accomplished what you've, what you've set out to do with your product. And so Hattie makes some intuitive sense. I mean, it, you know, uh, uh, people have have crushed the idea of being too systematic and, and draconian, and it came from military design early on, and so designing training for the military. So, I mean, it has that kind of flavor to it. But in all, it makes some sense. There's some sense-making that you can do from Addy. There are things that it can be used for. I think when people balk, where people balk at it and is that it doesn't seem to take into account the flexibility we need in designing stuff, that creative side. It's, it's so heavily loaded on the uh, scientific side of what we do um, that it doesn't take into account all kinds of other things we can bring to the table. Um, uh, uh, and even though uh, somebody who is, a, 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 I, I don't know, an apologist for Addy might suggest that those things are in there and that we're just uh, over overreacting to the boxes and arrows we see on the screen. I'd say that once you have a boxes and arrows on the screen, it takes on a life of its own. It's starting to speak a language of its own. And uh, so we almost need to force ourselves out of that sometimes, acknowledging what it brings to the table, acknowledging what it contributes, using those things when we need them, um, and then moving on and, and doing other things as well. Well, Brent Wilson from um, uh, University of Colorado at Denver and some others um, took a really hard look at um, traditional instructional design and trying to move it to a more constructivist orientation one time. And he really did a, a neat job, I think, of saying, wait a second, when we're doing ID, if we're going to focus on a more constructivist rather than an objectivist uh, perspective like we see with Addy. I mean, so it's, it's implied in it anyway. Um, they said, 
what would it look like if we try to approach processes of instructional design from a constructivist perspective? I thought that's really cool. Um, and, and they did, I'm not going to go into their entire paper. You can look up their paper. I, um, we should have it as a, as a resource uh, uh, for you in the course. Um, and they go into a lot more detail, but just, um, just to chat a little bit about some of the ideas that they had. Well, when you're moving to a more constructivist instructional design process, it's, it's acknowledging that in traditional instructional design, it was, it was practiced in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. Um, uh, it's un we're, we're unaccustomed to considering the larger political, ethical, and value implications of our, of our practice. It doesn't seem to play in heavily into those models. And then... Um, the emphasis in traditional idea in controlling complexity and trying to simplify. So with traditional ID, we try to take complex ideas and boil them down and, and simplify stuff for the learner. Uh, constructivist ID uh, is, it more recognizes that learning problems are complex and celebrates that, and we want to manage that complexity, but we don't want to boil all the juice out of it. We want to uh, um, help novices learn how to navigate the complexity, but still keep uh, uh, the richness of a complex learning problem in front of us. It's a, it's, it's, that's a difficult, it's a two-edged sword, it's difficult to do. Um, uh, a constructivist model of ID would emphasize effective creative design and efficient management and control, okay? So we do want to control stuff and we want to do things efficiently, but we want to be creative in how we do that. That control and management side may sound draconian to you, but remember that usually as an instructional designer, you're working for people who are paying you <laughs> to design stuff. And that efficiency can be an important factor in your success as an instructional designer. And uh, so you just don't, you just can't sit back and think great thoughts all the time. You got to get the job done. And, and so doing that uh, efficiently and managing your resources well and things like that, very important part of, of uh, the entire ecology of instructional design practice. Okay, but effective creative design, we're talking about things like elegant treatment of layout, elegant, okay? It's not always a word you think about when you think of instruction, but elegant. Um, an appropriate look and a feel, a reasonable navigation, professional level production skills, a proper application of design research. Um, all of those kinds of things playing into effective creative design. Efficient management and control, uh, I mean, we need to ask questions like what do learners re learn, really? What are they really learning? Are they motivated by the instruction? Do they see value and relevance in it? Uh, do learners use their knowledge to solve problems in authentic performance settings? So if you teach them something, do they then use it? Do they use it to, to uh, um, answer their own problems? Um, are learning environments rich in information and guidance and support and all of those kinds of things? That's an important part of management and control. Uh, will the instructional product reflect a return on investment for, your, for, for the people investing in what you're doing? Um, is the development process efficient? Or have you figured out a way of going, of going about things that you will actually achieve things in a reasonable time and on budget, and, and those sorts of things. Um, are the resources being well, well used in the design process? And is there systematic planning and decision making and accountability in the design process? Um, now, again, I think that there needs to be systematic planning, but perhaps the design process itself, once we get into that, we can jettison some of that and, and approach things in different ways uh, than traditional. Constructivist design teams are going to include a lot of people. Uh, the idea is that you don't work in isolation. You don't get a problem, go do a few analyses, and then sit down and design at your desk and come up with the world's greatest solution that you then go out and test. 
groups of people are involved in the design from the beginning to the end. The designers, and notice I put the around that. Uh, there may be several designers at work uh, on something. There could be a subject matter expert and clients and and the target audiences. You, you should be using and involving the learners wherever possible in what we're doing. We'll talk about that more in, in a design thinking sense. And then members of the broader community of views. Sometimes we forget that we design for a group, but then there might be a whole bunch of other people who use things. Several of the videos for this course have made public over time, and um, uh, it's always amazed me that I designed many of the things that we do for this course, but they then get implemented all over the place in a wide variety of other ways, and so as flattering as that is, it worries the heck out of me sometimes that they haven't been appropriately designed for the, for the uses that might be made of them. Of course, ultimately, you give that up and you, <laughs> you can't control it anyway. Um, generally speaking, constructivist ID methodology is going to be uh, apply a more holistic systems design model, okay? Uh, less systematic design. Less systematic, but more on the holistic side. It's going to approach the whole problem, the whole person, the whole event, the whole thing. Um, it's going to... Uh, fast track or use uh, layers of need models and rapid prototyping techniques. Generally speaking, you're going to be designing a whole bunch of sloppy prototypes that then you refine over time. And then you'll adapt ID methodology to the constraints of a given situation. In fact, that given situation is going to define what you do in the first place. There's no way that you will separate the events of instruction and what you're designing from the context in which it's going to be used. Okay? Those things you'll constantly check and constantly go back to make sure that those things are in alignment. And then it's user-based. Um, uh, both instructors and learners and anybody else in the design team, they're, they're all part of the design team. Everybody in the design team is, has responsibility for creating um, a, a great learning product. Okay, then, so one methodology or approach, general approach, that has gained some favor in Dealing with the creative side of things, it probably takes a strong uh, 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 leap into the creative and craft side of what we do, as Addy does into the systematic and scientific side of what we do. Um, and it's design thinking. Um, and I do want to make the point, and a strong point, that it's as much a state of mind as it is a process. People talk about design thinking processes. There's a general shape to how you approach stuff, but you could use different labels, and it is. If you look into design thinking, you're going to find a lot of different labels. There are a lot of uh, gurus of, uh, of design thinking out there who will give you their own, what sounds to me like a pretty systematic approach to uh, uh, designing things. And um, not that they're wrong, but I think we, I want to be loose with my labeling here, okay? Because what I want you to do is think about that state of mind you need to get into in order to think um, in big ways about the designs rather than the processes, procedures, and steps you've got to go through to get there. Okay? The design thinking mindset, I think that it's only through deep engagement, observation of, and empathy for learners and users can you hope to understand what's going on well enough to design solutions to fit? I, uh, it's that close association. When we talk about being learner-oriented or user-oriented or learner-centric when we do things, this is a methodology that just doesn't, doesn't just depend on that. It is that. It's that deep engagement with the user or the learner that drives literally 
all of the decision making that goes on. And if you get away from that, you've lost your path. Um, uh, in design thinking, we are learner centric. You focus on learners or users. Uh, your methods used are observation. You watch what they do. And that's often more important than what they say they do. Okay? You do interview them. <coughs> Pardon me. You do interview them, but uh, uh, you'll use many different methodologies, any way you can get to what are users really, really doing and what do they think about that. Um, and some of the other methods uh, is ideation, thinking about stuff, creating things, creating ideas, brainstorming, yeah, all of that, and prototyping, rapidly throwing together some of the key ideas and then building exemplars of how they might uh, look, feel, act, and perform. I'll give you an example of some of this in a minute. Um, design thinking is an iterative process. Now, I've sa I said iterative earlier. I said it correctly that time. Um, the problem is, is that you have to understand the problem. <laughs> You really need to get intimate with that problem. You've got to know what it is. And only the learners can show you what that is, usually by watching what they do and asking them why they do it. Um, we do need finding. What are the needs then? What are the particular needs that manifest themselves? And that's a process. It's an expansive process. But then when, once you... Uh, find a need, you try and synthesize those needs, and you kind of select one or two you're going to uh, focus on, and then you uh, ideate from there, create all kinds of ideas, build all kinds of prototypes, get as wingy as you possibly can with some of the prototypes, build some that are functional, some that are just pretty, some that do parts well but don't do the whole things. So you don't worry about building the perfect prototype. In fact, it's this entire process depends on you doing uh, partial prototypes that you can choose from, the best parts of, put those together, and start iterating back to uh, closer and closer final prototypes that will work. The whole idea is that you diverge and then you converge. Okay, you actually do that a couple of times in most processes, but, but the idea is that you understand that real problem deeply. It's complexity. You find out what's really going on with something. Um, uh, you generate a bunch of fast prototypes, and then you redefine the problem. You then look at your prototypes, and you say, well, what, what problem are we really dealing with with these prototypes? What problem is really solved? What do, and if it doesn't line up, you take the parts that line up with your understanding of the problem, and then with other parts, maybe you understand the problem differently by prototyping for it. It's a conversation that you have between the prototype and, and uh, your understanding of that problem, and you go back and forth and back and forth, usually through learners who might be involved with uh, uh, either the testing or uh, informing this from beginning to end. Um, so you redefine the problem and you converge on a solution set. You finally then converge on a solution set, and prototypes get progressively closer. So your various prototypes, they get better and better and closer and closer, more refined, each time iterate, iterating through this and, and hacking off the ends of some things and adding other things on, adding Play-Doh to them over here until you end up with something that actually works. So design thinking being if you're thinking of a process, remember that keep in mind that you have a constant attention to the learner and user, and you're regularly refining your understanding of the problem. And so you move through that process, that big process of understanding and need finding expansively, and then coming down to a synthesis and deciding on some needs that then you ideate and you, you brainstorm ideas and you build prototypes and it gets bigger and bigger and then you bring those prototypes back together and iterate and iterate and iterate until you finally move back and forth until you get to a solution set 
that you're satisfied with. Now, Addy versus design thinking, just by putting the verses in there, it sounds like these are competing with each other. And in a way they do. They're very different ways of looking at the world. No doubt about that. And I think that we do have people who live in either of those camps. I'm really excited about design thinking approaches and studio teaching those. And, and uh, uh, so that's part of instructional design that really excites me and keeps me moving. But I also have a strong appreciation for Addy and some of the things and the tool skills and the tool set that it brings to the brings to the conversation. I think both have a place. And I think each can inform the other. I think when we're doing need finding in design thinking, some of the tools we use in needs analysis in from Addy are exactly complementary. I mean, they're things that we can take from one that we know how to do and apply it when we're in the process. Uh, in another process. So I think that that crosstalk is important and to respect that th those tool sets, those, many of those things that you learn in uh, the basic instructional design course, very useful. Pick and choose, use them in a design thinking uh, uh, context. You know, when do you do one or the other? Well, Ask how well defined is a problem and a solution before you begin. Now, I hate to break it to you, but as instructional designers, you won't always be controlling your own solutions. You'll have problems brought to you, and a client will say, here's your problem. Fix it. Or they'll say, I want you to design some uh, online instruction to address this and I'll pay you to do that. Well, the problem's been, you've been given the problem. Uh, it isn't like um, they're asking you to go off and, and explore that problem a great deal. They aren't asking you to do needs assessments, and so sometimes those things aren't even available to you to do, even if you want to. Um, so in some cases, if you have a really well-defined problem that's handed to you, whether, it's, <laughs> whether you think it's right or not, uh, you have different responsibilities there. Um, Sometimes you have to take it and build from that, okay? And maybe Addy provides you the processes, many of the processes you need to do that. Um, sometimes if you have an ill-defined problem, that's one of the best places to bring in design thinking. Whereas if you did Addy stuff, you might end up in the wrong place entirely because you've tried to squeeze all the complexity out of it. You've tried to pin it down too early. Only by exploring through iterative development and prototype development and over and over and messing with ideas and, and uh, knocking stuff back and forth with other people, can you even come to a solution of a well an ill-defined uh, problem that makes any sense whatsoever? So both of those things may inform which direction you emphasize, whether you emphasize design thinking or you emphasize uh, more systematic kinds of design. Um, how much latitude do you have? Does your client or whoever's bringing the problem to you, or do, are, they, are they willing to allow, are they going to give you a lot of rope? Uh, will they allow you the time and the resources necessary to uh, uh, do some of the more creative, expansive kinds of uh, things that you do with design thinking? And then how much creativity is necessary or desirable? Sometimes, I mean, you look at something and it's a pretty mundane problem. It's a pretty mundane solution set. We probably know what those things are. And yeah, we could probably get really innovative and creative and come up with some new approach, but sometimes it's just not worth the trouble. Um, and you've got to design it. You've got a lot of things. In other words, you've got a lot of decisions to make. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I, I share parts of this, I think, in the uh, needs assessment. Uh, when, uh, you may have run across it with the uh, needs assessment video in 873, um, where I'll give you an example where design thinking clashed with Addy. <laughs> and and uh, there's a punchline to it. We, as I was uh, on sabbatical one time and working for a company that did um, 
uh, instructional design, professional instructional design. And so I was working with uh, a team of instructional designers, but particularly one other instructional designer and I were working together. And it was uh, a problem that was brought to us by the financial vice president of um, a grocery store chain. Um, and I won't go beyond that. Um, this grocery store chain, this is a financial manager, and he was very frustrated, or a financial vice president, he was very frustrated that store managers, and there were about 20 different stores in a, um, a geographic area, and he was very frustrated that the managers were expected to write monthly reports based on their analysis of two financial documents that his group sent out. So one was called the charge gross report, and the other one was the store operating statement. And so the vice president, you can imagine, spent a lot of time and resources with his division at corporate headquarters to, with, with financial people putting together these reports uh, that should inform operations at the store level. Well, they weren't. They weren't being used. The reports he was getting back from the managers suggested that, that oh, I mean, the, the reports, you should have seen them. I mean, they were just, they, they, they weren't much, okay? Uh, pretty shallow treatment of things, and they didn't really seem to care very much. And um, they weren't really investing in applying what they could learn from the store operating statement charge gross reports to how they might lay out product or emphasize one product over another, how might they, they might rotate stock, how they might put some stuff on sale, you know, all those kinds of decisions that are made in grocery stores all the time, all the time by managers. Um, they uh, it, it just wasn't being used appropriately. And so they put us on, he said, I want some online training developed, or I, actually it was computer-based training at the time, he said, I want some computer-based training uh, teaching these people how to, uh, how to read and analyze these two reports. And I want you to go off and just design that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, give that computer-based instruction to them uh, on a laptop. And they'll be given time to sit down in their offices and do it go through it and learn how to do this appropriately. Okay, well, you can imagine it's a pretty well-defined problem, right? Well, my friend and I, my colleague, uh, other instructional designer and I, we did a couple of things. We, uh, we went into a room to try and learn the charge gross reports and store operating statements ourselves. We, we decided if we, if we had to put the stuff together, we had to learn the stuff. If we had to put together instruction around it, training, um, we had no know it well. And so we went in and we spent two weeks in a room writing on walls, literally, um, bouncing off those walls sometimes, trying to figure out these reports. They were some of the densest, most obtuse uh, financial reports you ever saw. They... Uh, they were difficult to follow. The categories were difficult to interpret. I mean, they didn't make common sense. You couldn't find how uh, things listed in this part had anything to do with that part. The reports themselves were really, really difficult to understand. Well, we thought we were dumb, maybe. What's going on? So we went and we met with store managers. We said, tell, tell us about uh, how you go about doing things. Why do you, uh, how do you do your reports at the end of the month? Okay, and, he's, and they told us really beautifully that uh, they made it up as they went along because they couldn't interpret the reports. Uh, and they didn't have time to mess around with trying to understand reports. They were busy trying to move product out the door and, and manage their stores and their personnel. They, they were very busy people. They didn't understand what was going on, and they really didn't have that much interest in doing it because they just saw it all as stupid. And so that was pretty clear to us. We had these reports. We decided to talk with those managers about, well, what information 
would you like to have? I mean, what would help you make decisions around here? And they started to tell us in very clear fashion. Now, we had spent two weeks learning those reports, so we actually knew them really well by then. And um, uh, we figured out something that was very, very elegant right away. We said, you know, part of our, we started fast prototyping. Let's throw together some new reports. We'll start pro prototyping some new reports, fast prototyping. We knocked out a few, knock them, but we didn't even call it design thinking at the time. We didn't even know that's what we were doing. But we had redesigned that problem. We came to a really rich understanding of a very complex problem that had, was only partially about those reports or only partially about what the financial vice president thought it was. And so we thought, we're onto something here. We're not going to design instruction. We're going to redesign the reports. And so we went through and we did about four or five different uh, uh, versions of the reports. We bounced them off the managers. The managers told us what would work and what wouldn't. It was really going well. And we finally got this thing to a place where we had an elegant, elegant solution. Um, a simplified store operating statement and charge gross report. It would solve most of the problems that are there. The managers wouldn't have to go through training. They wouldn't, and the corporate wouldn't even have to pay for a very expensive development of uh, computer-based training. They could solve their problems by providing their managers with a simplified report or a better report. It actually had all the complexity it needed. It was just laid out differently and it was, uh, you know, it won't go into the details, but you, you get the idea. Well, we took the idea proudly back to the vice president and showed our magical solutions to things, our solution sets that we had come up with, and he fed them back to us. He had no interest in changing his reports. What were we doing? We almost lost the contract for our company that day because... And the vice president was some irritated um, because that wasn't the job he'd given us to do. He told us to go design computer-based instruction. By golly, that was what we were supposed to do. He wasn't interested in this other thing because what would happen is he would then have to change the operations in his operation. He didn't want to do that. <laughs> he didn't want to change his division and what they were doing. He wanted to change the manager's responses to his existing system. So sometimes um, design thinking doesn't take you <laughs> where you might because the system of your, again, your context, you're contextually based. It's a rich environment in which you work uh, in instructional design and it's part of the excitement of it. Uh, 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 you can you can be working at cross purposes and not even knowing because the entire solution sets are complex and rich and interesting and um, uh, one of the reasons why being an instructional designer is such a fascinating uh, profession to be in I think because uh, we have these different uh, forces at work. So I don't think, again, that it's Addy versus design thinking. I think, actually, it's Addy and design thinking, and appropriately emphasizing one or the other, uh, uh, given the context you find yourself, your, yourselves. <laughs> so as instructional designers, learn both, practice both. Um, uh, you'll do some readings in both. You'll be doing uh, a course or courses. Uh, in the program, and all of our courses involve uh, design in, in, in one way or another. And uh, 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 so be thinking as a, um, uh, as a person who, with a rich tool set from Addy and a rich mindset in design thinking and how to bring those things together to, um, to accomplish the kinds of things you need to do as you move forward.